we're going to actually start with a video. Long ago, a mighty flood cleansed from the earth selfish human beings living out of harmony with nature. One man survived. With the world's animals surrounding him, he waited in vain for the waters to recede. And so, the animals retrieved a speck of dirt from the depths of the sea, and the man shaped it as it grew, until his hands could no longer carry the burden of the earth. Then Turtle emerged from the ocean. I have a strong back, he said, place it here. This new world flourished on that turtle's back until man set foot on a new world where all could live in harmony. Algonquin Creation Parable. Sea turtles are being hit from all angles. Most of the sea turtles that we see here are here because of human impact-related issues. The last three years, in fact, have been the hottest on record. Too hot is really bad. You can't recover from too hot. We will no longer have any males to help with the reproduction of this species. All of a sudden, turtles started to show up with maybe one or two little tumors on. What we see here is actually the stomach content of a single sea turtle that was found dead. The bottom of the food chain is starting to ingest the plastic and die. What we see happening to these turtles, we're eventually going to see happen to all of life. I've followed the environment for many, many years, and I think I've never seen anything quite as bad as what's going on now. These animals that tug at your heartstrings, that are these majestic sea creatures, really die off in these massive droves like this. It's truly apocalyptic, and it's happening before our eyes. We only have one home, one planet. There is no planet B. It can be said that human history is written in blood and salt water. From survival and sustenance to adventure and conquest, man has always looked toward the sea to provide. Perhaps no creature symbolizes our relationship with the ocean more than the sea turtle. While born on land, these archangels of the underwater world have navigated our waterways since the age of the dinosaur, filling a vital role in balance of every ecosystem they cross. But now, sea turtles are the ones in need of human protection. From the time their eggs are laid on hot sands to the time they swim out into polluted waters, sea turtles are under constant threat. Their plight tells a tale of how our march toward progress has left a trail of unintended consequences that threatens their very survival and ours. Conservationists believe the health of the sea turtle tells us the health of the ocean, and the health of the ocean reflects the health of the planet. So what are these creatures trying to tell us now? Could they be sending us an urgent warning? And will we listen in time? Hi, and welcome again. I'm Mary with the West Regional Library, and you are tuned in here towards to Troubled Waters, The Turtle's Tale. This is a production of WLRN Public Television, Florida's South Florida storyteller serving audiences from Key West to West Palm Beach. Troubled Waters joins over 30 award-winning television productions that are produced and shared by WLRN with PBS affiliates across the country. Troubled Waters, A Turtle's Tale was nationally distributed on April 1st, 2020. To date, the film has been scheduled and broadcasted on PBS stations reaching viewers in over half the country. And now we're going to proceed to a little chat exercise. So if you are there and uh, in the lower part of your screen, there should be like a little dialogue bubble, and you'll put your answer there. Ready to begin? Here's your first question. Just entering that in now into the chat. I hope you found your chat box and just put it to everyone. Next question. 
I want to know if you have watched the film. Have you watched the full film? It's 53 minutes in length. And then uh, the next question is, what do you want to learn about the sea turtles? Anything at all that you may have a question about from the film, or if you haven't watched it, what would you like to learn? We will try to answer those questions throughout the program. And now our panelists. Oh, so we're, I'm so excited to have our panelists, five of them today with us. And just an overview, because I'll be going into their biographies shortly. Uh, we have Courtney Fielding, who is the film writer and co-producer of today's film. She's uh, working with her dad. That's her dad alongside her. And they're a father-daughter team, as you guessed. And uh, or Courtney's up in Orlando joining us today. We have Caitlin Bovary, who's up in Boca Raton. And she is a sea turtle rehabilitation assistant. And as you know her from the film, she's one of the stars in the film. Uh, and works with Gumbo Limbo Nature Center Sea Turtle Rescue. We also have Kat Uden. Catherine Uden is with Oceana USA out of Hollywood, Florida. She is a former educator and now campaign organizer with them. We have Dr. Derek Burkholder and his colleague Stephanie Kudzeff. Dr. Derek, we're so glad you could join us uh, from Nova Southeastern's Meek Center. That's the Marine Environmental Education Center. And he's a research scientist with Guy Harvey Research Institute and Save Our Shark Sea Turtle, or sorry, Save Our Sharks Shark Center, Save Our Sea Shark Center, say that fast. He's the director of the Meek uh, at the Carpenter House and the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. So lots of hats Derek has. And Stephanie is a natural resource specialist with Broward County's environmental planning and community resilience. She is in environmental protection and growth management here in the Fort Lauderdale area. Next, um, I have another word from our sponsor, and that is, of course, WLRN Public Television. They've created this curriculum that's very exciting because it dovetails really well with this film, the documentary film. There are activities in here in this guide uh, that help students learn about Florida's fragile ecosystems. And that also teaches social mindedness and environmental responsibility. The curriculum explores the interactions between the sea turtles, us humans, and science concepts. And what's great is it follows the um, next generation Florida Sunshine State standards. Please copy down the URL if you're interested, a homeschooler, or if your parents are homeschooling you, or if you're a school teacher. It's, um, there for you. And here are some of the vocabulary words that you might have recognized if you saw the film, fibropapilloma. You might even put that in if you don't know what it is as it's questioned into the chat. But I'm quite sure um, if you saw the film, you know what those are. Uh, biodegradable, you may already know that word and so on. So let's move to our collection. Our collection is now highly uh, electronic these days. We've been, like public libraries, been able to adapt real well really well. We have Overdrive and Libby, which are two of our largest ebook, e electronic book, and uh, e-audio books we have in those two. And Hoopla as well has those two formats as well as documentary films. So please do check those out later on. Uh, and then we have Access 360, which is designed for children K through 12. We have others, but this is just the, the sampling. We have Canopy, which has other documentary films not on this slide. Anyway, I did a search on sea turtles and look at all these different books that came up. 23 uh, books. You'll see the little icons on the slides indicating whether it's an e-book with the open book or uh, headphones for the e audio book. So many types of species besides turtles that we can read about. And this is just uh, three books that I found upstairs in our big regional library here, uh, West Regional. They're written by ecologists or naturalists, people who study turtles and have gone into depth researching them. Uh, they're all very, very uh, hopeful books, and they all each encourage us to, to step back and, and care for these creatures, because when we do that, we are caring for the planet. As we hear the messaging from the film, and hopefully you'll hear that messaging again, I'm sure, as you read our content from the library. All right, so this is the last slide I have for you. And these are um, 
nonprofit organizations, mostly in the state of Florida, but also in Costa Rica, we have the Leatherback Trust, and we have Save the Sea Turtle Foundation, which is an excellent one right here in town. And that's where you can adopt a sea turtle nest and a sea turtle. You can follow them by satellite tracking, and you can sign up for their newsletter. And so that concludes the PowerPoint. And let's go back to our very first guest, our panelist, where our first panelist is Courtney Fielding. And welcome again to you, Courtney. And I want to just briefly go over your background because we're excited that we have a real live journalist with us who studied, uh, has a real live degree from Annenberg School of Journalism. So uh, we're impressed. And uh, you have in your background this LA, syndica LA Times syndication and NPR. And uh, you are, you know, part of this team. And we want to know first how you became a film writer. Okay, well, hello, and I'm uh, from Orlando, but right now I'm in a wood-paneled room here in uh, on vacation in Boone, North Carolina, so I'm, I haven't bunkered up, but it, it does look a little bit like that, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad that you're impressed about my graduate degree in journalism because uh, paying it off uh, for quite some time, so glad to hear you're enjoying it. Um, so, oh yeah, so first and foremost, I, I guess it's, it's a little bit cliche, but I consider myself like a storyteller and it takes all shapes and forms with film being one of those forms. And, you know, my background, I started in newspapers, radio, um, a little bit of broadcast. And at the same time, my father has also been in broadcast documentary um, for decades. And we started working together doing shorts for PBS uh, years ago. And, um, that was kind of my introduction into short form documentary. And then uh, an opportunity arose a couple of years ago to, uh, to partner with PBS and do a long form environmental film. And uh, that's what you guys were watching today, what we're here to talk about. And then um, that's really, really interesting, Courtney. It's so great to be able to work with your dad, I think. I'm just, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> So how did your dad and you get together to make this particular film, though? So we uh, were talking to WLRN, and they wanted to basically just behind the scenes test us out to see what filmmaking skills, what storytelling we could bring um, to the table. So we basically pitched them a few different shorts that we were just going to do a five-minute piece. And one of those was an article in the Sun Sentinel, Dr. Uh, Jeanette Weineken, who had uh, just released a study showing – basically missing males in the sea turtle population here in South Florida. And it was buried on the inside of the paper. And we put that on our list as something that could be really interesting to present to them. And uh, we sent that along with a list of other possible shows and they loved it and gave us the green light to go out and one day of filming FAU uh, labs at Gumbo Limbo and see what we could bring back. And, um, you know, we brought back a little bit more than what they were anticipating, and uh, <laughs> that turned us into an hour, <laughs> essentially. Wow. Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, every time I ask, I, I get a, more information because it's really complicated. It sounds like filmmaking is, is so many multiple steps. Involved. It is. Well, like anything in life, there's a lot of steps to it, but, you know, it's kind of something that has to exist in flow a little bit, right? You you start with what you think you know, and then you get there and you realize you don't know that much about what you think you know. <laughs> and then you go with with what you think. Um, and then you have to enroll other people along the way as to why this bigger subject or this other area is so important to give you the time, the money, the resources to uh, invest in. And that's a little bit of, of, of how it works. Yeah, that's just the tip of the iceberg, it sounds like. so. Um, you know, this whole thing about independent film. So you really are committed to the independent film genre, you would say? Or... Well, you know, we, there's so many different ways to tell a story. And I think each story lends itself to a different format, a different funding structure. Um, I think that for us, especially in this climate, there is such a great opportunity to go independent um, because so many people want to be involved. Um, and, you know, just for instance, like we are pulling in grants for this next movie, which is a sequel um, focusing on plastic and its hidden effects on human health um, all around us. And we have grants, we have crowdfunding, 
we have all these models that allow us to kind of take an independent lens um, because, you know, when you take money, you're also taking influence. That's just the way it works. Um, and, you know, honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit impossible to say you're 100 percent independent. You know, we are <laughs> we are people that form groups and, um, you know, there's always backwash. But being independent allows us to make the movie, create what we would like to create, and then we can show it independently. We can show it on Netflix. We can show it on HBO. We can make those deals. But the but the project itself remains the story that we want to tell in the form that we want to tell it, which is amazing. And that's the benefit of an independent film. Excellent. Okay. And and you you already dipped into my next question, which was great. Um, your next sequel, well, the sequel to this one. Yes. If you would like, you can just put in that URL. I'm going to move now towards our next clip. Keep us on track. So I'm liking what I'm seeing in the chat, so I'm thanking the panelists for sharing all their expertise and rich information. Plastic is one of the few things the immense power of the ocean can't destroy. If the pilgrims traveling on the Mayflower had plastic water bottles to throw overboard as they made their way to the new world, we'd still be finding them in the water today, just in smaller pieces. My mom is a marine biologist, so I grew up with the conservation mindset my entire life. When I was little, there would be kids with their buckets full of sand and full of seashells, and mine would be filled with trash that I picked up off the beach. We got a total of, what was it, seven, or 53 pounds of trash today, just in one hour, um, which is crazy. Where did you find this? So all of this trash right here was picked up this morning on that beach right out there. Oh, yeah. So do you see that there's, like, tons of plastic in here? So right in here, there is a triangular-shaped piece taken out of this plastic, and that is, we believe, to be from sea turtles. Right now, sea turtles are eating plastic lighters, bottle caps, bits of straws, toothbrushes, all of the throwaway plastic items that we're buying. Sea turtles die because they think they're eating a jellyfish or something good, but it's a shiny piece of plastic. Current estimates are that we're using about five trillion plastic bags a year. And that's also the one estimate anyway of how many pieces of plastic there are in the ocean today. Of all those plastic bags, we've only recycled about 1%. And I'd be surprised, honestly, if it was that high. What we see here is actually the stomach content of a single sea turtle that was found dead uh, two years ago. And you can imagine, if this is in your stomach, you'll feel uh, saturated. You actually don't get any nutrients in. So you, you know, there's, of course, a risk to starvation, to death. And also, it causes turtles to be more buoyant. And a lot of them, they have to feed on the seabed. So um, yeah, if you can't dive down again, of course, that's another problem. So I think this is really a testament to how big the plastic pollution problem is. While adult turtles are often able to pass the plastic they eat, for hatchlings, it's a death sentence. Last year, we actually had 4,000 hatchlings in our rehabilitation facility. With every sea turtle that dies here, we, we do a necropsy, and 100% of our sea turtles that we necropsy, hatchling size, are filled with some sort of plastic. Why are younger turtles so affected by plastic debris? It's largely because of where they live. Unlike adults that roam the ocean, hatchlings stay in the weed lines searching for food. Their feeding grounds are also a perfect trap for plastics. They swim out to what's called the sargassum, which is the weed line. And they will live on the weed line until they're about four years old. So on the weed line, they're eating and gaining strength. But the weed line now is full of plastic particles. So by default, they're just eating the plastic. We keep this and we show it to the public so they understand how plastic's in impacting the little guys. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big problem. As you can see, some of this plastic's really sharp. It's painful. It can puncture their gut. Plastic debris affects not just turtles, but all marine life. 60 years ago, plastic was found in 5% of seabirds. Today, it's 90%.
Whales from Germany to Thailand have been found dead, their stomachs filled with plastic bags, buckets, even car parts. There's so much plastic in the ocean at this point that we find it off of Antarctica, we find it in Arctic waters, we find it at the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean. It's literally everywhere that we've ever looked, we're finding plastic now. The real problem is plastics disintegrate. They don't go away, but they get into smaller and smaller and smaller little pieces that the bottom of the food chain, which is so important for you and me, they have food. The bottom of the food chain is starting to ingest the plastic. So from there, it travels up the food chain. We're eating plastic, we're drinking plastic, we're breathing plastic. At this point, we've produced so much that we really can't escape it. It's in our drinking water, it's in our seafood, it's in our sea salt. If you look at the coastal waters around the world, they will be full of whatever it is we are doing on land, meaning you may be 15, 20 miles from the beach, but you change your oil and it gets in a storm drain and it eventually everything ends up in the coastal water. So if you're farming on a near a river and you're, all the pesticides you're using end up flowing into the ocean. So our, all the plastics we use end up in the ocean. Everything gets washed into the ocean. We thought we could dump anything for the longest time and now we are realizing we can't that the oceans have taken pretty much everything they can take, and now it's starting to have an impact on our health. Okay, so next up, I'm going to bring up our next guest, which is Kat Uden from Oceana, USA. And she's got a message for us. So I'm going to just introduce Kat right now. She is a former educator with Broward County, or with Broward County Schools. She's worked with environmental clubs in her career. She's won an award in um, environmental education. And she's brought youth to the Youth Ocean Conservation Summit in uh, Sarasota. She's also a racing uh, paddleboarder, a stand-up paddleboarder. So she's competing and she does cleanups while on the board of her paddle. And she goes out on weekends, you know, with her kids, and they're always out on the paddle boards. So, but Kat, I'd like you to tell us more about how you became an educator first. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, I started uh, substitute teaching for a few years and then decided I wanted to be a teacher. So I taught for Broward Schools for 15 years. And um, while I was teaching for Broward Schools, I also began volunteering on ocean causes with Surfrider Foundation. And I loved it so much and I loved the ocean so much that I decided to leave teaching and work on it full time. Great, good for you. And so how long have you worked for Oceana? Uh, over two years now. Like you can say over two years. I know a couple of yeah. you have been in this field though for 10 years. I think it's Stephanie and Caitlin have been each at their jobs for 10. So it's, it's great, the level of knowledge that you have. So as a campaign organizer, how do you do your work? How is it that that's different from doing individual work on plastics? Yeah, um, well, individual work on plastics, a lot of people do some really good things, um, you know, even just personal things like switching to reusable items instead of using single-use plastics. Um, I think a lot of people, like me, get their start through cleanups, so they go to a lot of waterway cleanups, a lot of beach cleanups, and I think after a while you um, just want to do something bigger and tackle it at the source, which is why I started volunteering for Surfrider Foundation Broward Chapter, and we started passing local ordinances to reduce plastics. So I'm really excited that now with Oceana, I get to do that uh, full time because I'm very passionate about reducing plastic pollution. Yes, and I think all of us are on this panel. So I'm, I know you have a special message that you want to share with us, so I'm going to be bringing up your slideshow. Okay, and I want to say thanks to Sam Jarvis in the comments. He mentioned Ted Danson in the film. He's wonderful. He's one of Oceana's board members and very supportive of our plastics campaign. Yeah, he, yes, Ted Danson. He's the man. I I just love watching him on in this film. So in case anybody um, wasn't aware, uh, Oceana is the world's largest international ocean conservation organization. We work on many different campaigns to save the world's oceans, and one of them is the campaign to reduce plastic pollution at its source. 
So the reason why we're reducing plastic at its source is because plastic production, as we know, is very harmful to the environment. Plastic is made from fossil fuels, the oil and gas industry. Um, it contributes to greenhouse gases and climate change. Uh, we want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, the plastic production is expected to quadruple from 2014 to 2050. And if we look at global plastics production in 2015, 36% of the uh, industrial sector was plastic packaging. So this is single-use material designed for immediate disposal. We only use these things for a couple minutes, and they're easily avoidable, things like plastic water bottles and plastic food packaging. And when the Ocean Conservancy does their cleanup every year, they, they tally the data and they look at what is um, commonly the most collected item on our beaches, and those were single-use plastics. And if you look at many of these items, these are, again, things that are used for a couple minutes, you know, maybe less, and things that we can very, very easily avoid and replace. You know, a lot of people think about recycling as the solution to the problem, and if you look at the projection of how much we're expected to produce um, versus, you know, what we can what we can recycle, we just cannot keep up with the plastic waste that's going to be generated. We need to reduce this at the source, and again, looking at it, we uh, we really we need to reduce it because it's made from fossil fuels. Also, we used to a lot of people don't realize we used to ship a lot of our plastic waste to China, and China en enacted a. Uh, a policy called National SOAR. They stopped taking our plastic waste, so a lot of our plastic does not get recycled. Only about 9% of plastic ever recycled, uh, uh, ever produced gets recycled, and only 2% is effectively recycled into something of equal or greater value, so usually downcycled. And this is one of our favorite quotes from Jackie Savitz at Oceana, and it's, when your bathtub is overflowing, you don't run for a mop before you turn off the faucet. Recycling is the mop, and we need to turn off the faucet. So we need to reduce our plastics. So Oceana is working um, uh, kind of in many different ways, federal, state, and local, and also asking corporations for change. So this is what we can do nationwide. There's a great bill that was introduced, and it's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. It is Senate Bill 3263, HR 5845, and it would do a variety of things, as you can see, to reduce plastic pollution at its source and put more responsibility on the producer rather than the consumer. So please ask your members of Congress to co-sponsor this bill. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the petition in the chat that makes it very, very easy for you. Now, here in Florida, unfortunately, we have these things called preemptions, and preemptions means a ban on a ban. So in all these states that are enacting uh, plastic bag bans and things to reduce plastics, unfortunately, here in Florida, we have preemptions. So we have a ban on bans for plastic bags and expanded polystyrene foam. What can we do about these preemptions? So you can help by asking your Florida state elected officials to remove these preemptions and let us be able to decide for ourselves how we want to reduce plastic. You can also ask them for a statewide ban on bags or foam, and you can also ask your city to pass a resolution of support for these uh, initiatives. And I will end up putting a um, in a minute the um, the link to find your Florida state representative to ask them to do something about plastic pollution. Here locally, um, we can still do things, even though we have these preemptions, we can still work in our cities to prohibit the use of plastic, certain plastic and foam products on city property. So even though, for example, we can't ban foam outright, we can ban it on our own city property, which a lot of municipalities have done already and are working towards, and we can help you with that if you contact me. You can also prohibit plastic bottled water on city property, with which the Village of Miami Shores did this year. You can ban single-use plastic items that don't fall under our preemptions, like utensils and straws, which many cities have. And you can also ask for a straws by request only ordinance. And that's kind of a win-win for everybody because the business saves money when they when when you refuse a straw. So if you want a straw, you get one. If you don't, you you don't get one, and it saves the business money. These are all the ways that you can help and get in touch with us. So we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Oceana and Oceana in Florida. And then that's my email address. If you would like help asking your mayor, your city commissioner, your state rep um, for action on plastics, you can copy me on that email or ask me for help. I'd be happy to guide you in that direction. And that is the website that you can use to take action on all of our campaigns. So, Kat, each of these, these um, yeah, so that's the Facebook, again, Instagram, and mm -hmm. Twitter, and email. So, yeah. so we have the larger Oceana, and we also have an Oceana in Florida, so look for both. 
Yeah, international organization there. All right, that's our last slide, right? Okay. I believe so. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to go into our next clip, which is from Florida Atlantic University, the Too Hot to Hatch clip. At FAU Labs, Dr. Jeanette Wyniken and her team have been studying the effect of rising temperatures and drier summers on the sea turtle populations for the last 18 years. Their findings confirm what conservationists are seeing on the beaches. During the worst years, less than 40% of eggs hatched. And now, an even more worrisome discovery, missing males. In turtles, sex is determined by the nest's environment. Warmer temperatures produce females and cooler temperatures produce males. For the last 10 years, virtually all hatchlings have been born female. In fact, not a single male hatchling has been found on the beaches here in over three years. A lot of the turtles that we saw were trapped in these rotten eggs. And then they also had some birth defects that uh, we picked up on later. It's, it's kind of alarming to go out and look at what's happening in nature and not be able to find males. And what we saw over the last three years was pretty darn frightening. A good sea turtle nest is incubating somewhere between 85 and 92 degrees. We were getting nests that were incubating up around 96, 97 degrees. That's not, not compatible with production of hatchlings. Hot nests often result in tiny heat-stressed turtles with birth defects. This is a, an example of a turtle with a birth defect. It has a double cleft palate, so that's part of the palate is gone on both sides. In 2016, we had the hottest year on record, and we also had the dry, one of the driest summers on record, and our production of nests dropped to less than 50%. Uh, so the nests were being laid, they just were, the embryos were dying in the nest and they were never turning into hatchlings. So in 2016, it was a nightmare. Is this a Florida problem? Well, we now know, no, it's not just a Florida problem. It's also a problem in Australia where there's a, recently been some very good work done. Research scientists studying Australia's Great Barrier Reef are reporting a 99% female bias in green sea turtle populations. Hotter seas are affecting turtles in other ways, as dying reefs mean dwindling food supplies. Half of the Great Barrier Reef has been bleached to death since 2016 due to rising temperatures. Massive efforts are being made to save what's left. Our next speaker up, Dr. Derek Burkholder. Welcome, Derek. So I know you resided as a kid up in Albion, Michigan. As I said, I used to, I went to school in Holland, Michigan. So I know we were both part of the Great Lakes College Association knowing you went to Albion and I went to Hope College. So um, you received your bachelor's degree up there, and during that time you spent uh, there, you were studying marine research. And then you went down to Moat Marine Lab in the Keys, and you, be, were, you were a research scientist with them. So during your doctorate program, you got your Ph.D. in top-down control on seagrass communities, so um, working with the herbivore sea turtles, right? So um, I know that you work at the Meek House, and I thought I'd start by asking you, uh, in your position there, what would you tell us to do first once it reopens over there? What can we do in Hollywood Beach at the Carpenter House, which is the Meek Center? It's really the same. Um, as a volunteer, maybe you can share with us how, how we can get involved as volunteers, just if we were taking a first visit there for the first time. Thank you very much for having me on the panel here today. Um, the Marine Environmental Education Center is normally an open to the public center. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we are still shut down right now. Um, and we are, however, hosting a seminar series. And so every Tuesday and Thursday um, at 3 o'clock in October, anyway, starting at 3 o'clock in October, every Tuesday and Thursday, we've got different speakers talking about everything from birds to sharks, sea turtles, um, jellyfish, all kinds of different things. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've been doing that for the last several months. Um, we do host virtual programs for school groups. 
Um, but once we are able to open, uh, I hope you can come down and visit us here on Hollywood Beach. Uh, we're open normally from Tuesdays through Saturdays from 10 to 5. And um, every day at 3.30, we feed Captain, who's our resident green sea turtle. Uh, Captain was hit by a boat about 10 years ago and so has some um, permanent injuries that allow, do not allow us to release her back into the ocean. So she's going to be a permanent resident here. Um, and so we, you know, tell a little bit of her history and, and feed her every day at 3.30. Uh, but we've also got um, a whole series of exhibits about everything from sharks, uh, marine debris, coral reefs, sea turtles, um, and pretty much everything else in between as well. So please come on down and meet Captain, meet some of our other smaller turtles, and, um, and say hi. Great. And, and if I want to be a volunteer, how old do I have to be? Um, for volunteering, we've got a, it's 16 years old and up. So we do have, we do have volunteers on site that help with, you know, everything from speaking to the guests here at the center to helping, um, you know, take care of the animals and things like that as well. So it's really, uh, depends on kind of what people are interested in, but we do have uh, some volunteers to help us out here for that. And, um, during feedback. And I see. Oh, okay. So, do you have access to the beach, and are there any turtle walks that are being done even during this time of, of the pandemic? Yeah. So the center is right on Hollywood Beach. Here, we do have direct beach access. Um, unfortunately, again, due to, to the pandemic, we are not hosting our normal hatchling releases. However. Um, Right now, the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program has just kicked off, which is sort of our partner organization here at the, at the meet. Uh, we just kicked off a virtual hatchling release program that's going to be going for the next uh, month or so. Um, and so I can, uh, I'll try to post a link to that. Uh, just sign up on our Facebook page. Um, and those are going to be, you know, educational programs um, to talk a little bit about what our normal hatchling releases look like this time of year. Right. That's great. At least we can see it virtually. We're not going to skip this summer completely or entirely. So I have a question here. Um, if we find a, a hatchling on the beach, what should we do? I know I've, I have a feeling we shouldn't touch it, but is there anything we could do? Put it somewhere that you could... Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, sea turtles are endangered species. All species of sea turtles are endangered and or threatened. And so they're all very well protected here in Florida. So, um, you know, you don't really want to pick it up or touch the animals. Um, but if you do see, um, you know, if you see a natural hatch out, then I would just say stand back. Don't turn any flashlights on. Enjoy the ability to watch that hatching going on. If you see an animal that's you know, stuck somewhere or in distress, you can call our emergency line. Uh, that number I have put in the chat, but that's 954-328-0580. Um, and we will respond to, you know, any of those six stranded, dead, injured sea turtles, adults or babies. Um, you know, we do, Gumbo Limbo does accept some hatchlings as well. And uh, Caitlin might be able to tell you a little bit more about their protocols. Um, but they've got a, a fantastic program where they will take these, um, you know, not so healthy hatchlings and, and raise them up a little bit to be able to release them again offshore. Excellent. Okay. I, I just had this question about your backdrop. It's incredible. So this is your office or this is part of the Carpenter House where you're broadcasting? Yeah, this is actually uh, part of the Marine Environmental Education Center at the MEEK here. Um, this is in our main education room. So these are just some of the different uh, specimens, skulls, shells, carapaces, things like that that we use for some of our education programs. But they are on display all the time here as well. You know, I've got a whole series of them, you know, different uh -huh. around next to me here, uh, different of, of all the different species and things. So uh, it's part of our, our educational displays, but again, something we also use in our programming as well. Well, I know I'm not the only one in this group that's going to go down there and check that out. Um, it looks like a movie set in and of itself. So I guess there's just one more thing, and that's all the beach etiquette. Like if we're walking late in the day on the beach during these nesting times of the year, what can we do? 
if we see sandcastles or holes in the sand, and, you know, in, in a nutshell? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, as, as you can imagine, these hatchlings that are coming out at night trying to make their way back to the ocean, or even the moms coming up to lay their eggs, um, any of those those sand castles are a lot of fun to build, obviously, when you're out on the beaches, but knock them down before you go home. Um, that that sand castle might be Mount Everest to that little hatchling if it runs into it. Um, and those holes as well create some pretty big problems for not only the babies, but also the moms. Um, they can fall in those holes and be injured um, or maybe even killed if they, you know, depending on how big the hole is. Um, but they they all create big problems for the animals, people, everything else on the beach. So definitely fill in those holes, knock down sand castles, make sure you're taking all of your trash and anything that you've taken out there with you and make sure it leaves the beach with you as well. Same thing, you want to make sure there's no beach chairs left out there, or umbrellas left in the ground for the turtles to get tangled up in. Um, and if you are out there at night and, um, you know, enjoying the beach at night, you want to make sure you don't have any flashlights on you, any lights on your phone or flash photography, any of that kind of stuff can really impact our sea turtles that are trying to, you know, lay their eggs or get back to the water if they are hatchlings. So if you do, if you're lucky enough to see a, a sea turtle out there, you just want to give it a lot of space. Definitely do not touch it. Um, like I said, they, they are a protected species. They're, it is illegal. It's terrible for the animals. So you want to make sure you, you give them their space, stay far back, enjoy it from a distance. You don't want to move around too much. Um, cause they can be spooked and they'll go back in the water without actually laying those eggs, even though they need to. So you want to leave them alone, let them do their thing. And just like I said, enjoy it from a distance. Okay. Thank you so much. Up next, our next guest is Stephanie Kreppa. She works with, um, Broward County as well, like Derek, and she's working with Broward County lighting ordinances for the sea turtles. She is, um, someone who is, um, working with local communities, all the little cities along the coast there, and the homeowners, too, and the businesses to improve their lighting for turtles. So Stephanie has uh, some slides to show us. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Mary, for having me. I'm really excited to, um, to join this panel. I think we have a lot of really great folks here today, um, and I'm just really happy to be a part of this. Um, so Derek kind of mentioned a little bit of um, – a little bit about lighting and sea turtles. And so that's a big part of what I do, um, you know, at my job at the county. Um, I encourage homeowners and businesses to make their lights turtle friendly um, for our sea turtles. Um, so I want to first tell everybody just a little bit about sea turtles um, so they can better understand why lighting can be a little bit problematic for them. And they're older than dinosaurs. They've inhabited the earth for over 200 million years. Um, and all reptiles breathe air and lay eggs, and that's also what sea turtles do. Now, since sea turtles have been around for so long, they have really strong instincts. And if you don't know what instincts are, um, instincts are things that we do without really thinking about it. Um, so we have instincts, too, like breathing when we're sleeping. And sea turtles use their instincts to find the ocean. And it's especially strong when they're hatchlings or babies, um, like these little guys in the picture. Probably girls. <laughs> Um, so one sure way that turtles found the ocean about 100 million years ago was by looking for light. And back then, the brightest area used to be the ocean, since the moon and the stars reflected off of the water. Um, but today, you can see in this picture, the brightest area is often towards land, since there's so many buildings with lights that are near the beach. And this can cause turtles to become confused, and sometimes they might not find the ocean. So not all light that's near the beach is bad. We do need some light to keep people safe, um, but a special type of light can keep both people and sea turtles safe, and it's called turtle-friendly lighting. And there's three, uh, three rules that make a light turtle-friendly. So the first rule is to keep it low, and this refers to the height of the fixture. If the light's low enough, it'll illuminate what you intend instead of casting unnecessary light up into the sky. Um, keeping a light low also refers to the amount of uh, lumens or the amount of light that that fixture is putting out. The uh, second rule of turtle friendly lighting is to keep it shielded. And that means that lights should be downward directed and fully shielded so that the bulbs are not visible. And this also helps direct the light where you want it to go, which is very good. The last rule of turtle friendly lighting is to keep it long. And this refers to the wavelength or the color of light. And long wavelength 
uh, light means that it can be amber or red, and LED is best. Um, sea turtles tend to ignore these colors of light, which is why they're really great for being near the beach. They just crawl away from them and don't really pay much attention to them. Um, so because of the benefits to other organisms um, with this type of lighting, sometimes it's actually called wildlife-friendly lighting, not just turtle-friendly lighting. Um, so low shielded and long wavelength light has benefits for other critters like bees, butterflies, other insects, bats, birds, and even humans. Um, so, like Mary, like you were saying, um, I work really closely with the coastal cities and homeowners and businesses, um, and a lot of this is because the coastal cities in Broward County recognize that it's important to keep sea turtles safe, so they've all adopted these turtle-friendly lighting ordinances. Um, and in short, they state that all lights should not be visible from the beach during the nesting season, which is March 1st through October 31st every year. Um, they encourage turtle-friendly lights if you need those lights for safety. Um, and I work together with those cities and all those businesses um, to make the lights friendly for turtles. Um, so if you guys know anybody with businesses near the beach that need a little bit of turtle-friendly lighting, um, feel free to give me a call, feel free to email me. I'm always available to help businesses and residents along the beachfront um, to make their lights turtle-friendly. Um, I'll put a link in the chat for FWC's uh, turtle-friendly lighting criteria that I went through that's low shielded and long wavelength. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here so I can put that into, um, into the chat for everybody. So thank you again so much for having me. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was very informative. Lots in there. There's a question. I don't know if you have this answer or if Derek does. So I'm going to pose it. It's what's the nesting season? It was mentioned uh, on the, you, you mentioned the East Coast. What is the season? time frame for the west coast of Florida? For yeah, yeah, so on the east coast, again, here in Broward County and north of us, it's March 1st through October 31st every year. Um, but down in Miami-Dade County and on the west coast, it's actually May 1st through October 31st. And the reason for that is because we get leatherback turtles nesting in Broward County and north of us. And the leatherback turtles nest in um, sometimes in February, but typically in March. And that's why our season starts a little bit earlier than everybody else. Okay, thanks again. And so our next clip is preceding our final guest, Caitlin. So please do stay. She has lots to share. We're going to look at the future is up to us. The solutions are pretty straightforward. We just have to stop burning fossil fuels. We have to shift from coal, oil, and natural gas to renewable green technologies like solar and wind. This stuff is in our power. This time that we're here is not just about us. It's about being good stewards of what we've been given. You know, when you walk around, when you go around the planet and the earth and your life, leave it in better shape than when you found it. My message to people is, yes, there's lots of scary stuff out there, but there are things that we can do to make them better. And you will feel so much more happy and joyous and engaged in life if you start being part of the, the solution. I really, truly mean that. Sea turtles have been around for around 100, 120 million years, somewhere in there. It's a long time. If we're the ones who are responsible for the extinction of sea turtles, that's, that's not okay. We can fix it. We can, you know, it's gonna take lots of different kinds of efforts, but we can, we can fix this problem. We can fix putting, you know, putting too much greenhouse gas in the air. We can fix keeping the plastics out of the ocean, get them out of the ocean. And, you know, those are solutions. And th those are achievable solutions. We start fixing those things, some of the other things will start taking care of themselves, and we won't be responsible for extinctions. Whether it's a simple thing, like not using plastic bags and bringing your own bags, or something a little bit bigger, like getting involved in uh, your local government and helping create change that can help all of our environmental uh, areas, all of our ecosystems, and help animals worldwide. We can make better decisions. I think for many of us, the real motivator is, is more about love and compassion than it is anger. Here's what you should do. You should go to the beach if you can, jump in the water, go fishing, walk with your kids along the beach, something that reconnects you to the joy that you get when you're around the ocean. Voyagers of the seas, ancient messengers from the deep, 
Sea turtles are showing us an imbalance in our world we can't ignore. If sea turtles are a barometer for the health of the planet, is it possible that by working to save these majestic creatures, we save ourselves as well? That was great. I just, you know, you feel thrilling. It's like a thrill to, to hear that. Um, I think maybe we all do share that feeling. And the last thing here is Caitlin. If we can get Caitlin to, I'm going to give the biography of Caitlin. She is from Gumbo Limbo Nature Center. It's not just a nature center, however. It is a combined uh, project with the city of Boca Raton and Florida Atlantic University. So there's much going on uh, at all times. And I think yesterday when I talked to Caitlin, she was in surgery. So she's a, an intense worker. And I always think of surgeons as very intense people. So I'm glad for what you do and that you're also currently on the board of directors for the Southeast Regional Sea Turtle Network and that your passion for marine conservation has led you to this career. And uh, now uh, you get to share with us some of the human impacts that the problems the movie exposes have on not just the wildlife, but on us. So I want to ask you to tell us how long you first, first of all, how long you've been working for Gumbo Limbo, and then if you have a favorite part of your job. I've been with Gumbo Limbo Nature Center for about five years now with the sea turtle rehabilitation facility. Uh, but like you said earlier, I've been in the sea turtle conservation field for over 10 years now. Um, so I've seen a lot of the impacts that we have on sea turtles specifically and wildlife in general, but also seen a lot of the things that we're doing to make changes and to be hopeful about the future, like the last clip was just talking about. There are so many small changes and big changes that people are making to get involved, get educated, and and learn about what the problems are facing our sea turtles. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of my job is, is sharing that with our community, um, both our local community and our global community, really getting to get the word out. Um, sea turtles are really amazing animals, and they're such a great way for people to connect with the problems that face our oceans as a whole. So plastic is a problem for sea turtles, but it's also a problem for tiny animals that people don't think about, like the smaller fish and krill and just the general conditions of our ocean. And so sea turtles are a really great way to uh, get people engaged and interested in what they can do to help. Yeah, I think in the film they have a great uh, metaphor that they are the archangels of the sea. And so, they are. so hopeful and so positive. They are. And they're also very vulnerable. And I think during our pandemic, we really, our heart goes out to them as they struggle to survive, as we do and many of our loved ones. And so um, this message to me, troubled waters, is uh, very multi-level. So um, I'm glad we get to shed some light on, on those different facets and that you're here to help. So let me just see, is there any current research being done at FAU um, for the hatchlings and that you could share with us? Absolutely. Um, we're really fortunate here at Gumbo Limbo Nature Center that we are a multifaceted partnership, like you mentioned. Um, we're a city park. We have the Sea Turtle Rehabilitation Facility, which is funded by the Friends of Gumbo Limbo to rescue turtles. And then Florida Atlantic University also has a research facility on site as well. And all of our conservation departments work very closely together with the FAU laboratory to help them conduct research on um, the temperatures. You saw Dr. Weineken in the film talking about it being too hot to hatch and the temperature of the nest really having some negative effects on the sea turtle populations, especially in South Florida. And South Florida is one of the most important loggerhead nesting beaches in the world. So it really does have global implications. And then in specifically in our sea turtle rehabilitation facility, we're also doing a lot of research about plastics uh, with our sea turtles. And so we've been seeing with our very young turtles, our washback turtles, which are about the size of kind of the palm of my hand here, so a couple months old, a little bit bigger than those fresh hatchlings, they're eating microplastics, and it, it's causing major health effects. So we're seeing hundreds of them that are washing up on our shores each year. They're weaker, and during those wind and wave activity, they wash up on our shores when they're, they're unable to swim in those conditions. And we're finding 
Um, of those that don't survive, uh, we perform an examination to see what happened. Um, and almost all of them have plastic somewhere in their gut. Uh, so it's really upsetting that we're seeing that, but it's interesting research. And then we're able to tell people about that in a very tangible way. Uh, you saw an image earlier from our Refuse campaign where we're asking people to join us in refusing single-use plastics and finding those alternatives. And we're committing to that as well on our property uh, to make some changes, especially in our gift shop and the, the products that we're selling as a part of that to make sure that we're uh, we're standing behind that mission. So I think there's there's a lot of really exciting research going on at our facility with all of our different partners that really trying to help protect sea turtles in a in an impactful way. Wow, that is so excellent to hear, you know, and it's just it just takes a whole group of us together and then to educate everyone. Thank you.